Breaking news. Canon Rumors has leaked a new $799 full frame camera that's going to move the price point for everything down, including cameras from Canon and Sony. I'm going to tell you all about it. But first, I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace, which just makes real good websites really easy for you. I am sick of trying to hire companies or go to restaurants that just use social media because social media gets increasingly more packed with ads and it's really hard to find what you actually need on social media. After all, your competitors can take out an ad and put it above your page. That's why whether you're a photographer or anybody running any kind of business, you should go to squarespace.com slash Tony, set up a website really cheap. It will pay for itself. When you're ready, use the coupon code Tony and save 10% off but you can try it out completely free. Thank you, Squarespace, and thanks to CanonRumors.com, who brings us these sorts of leaks. They consider this to be very reputable, and it makes total sense for me, too. In fact, just a couple of years ago, we predicted a $500 full-frame Canon mirrorless camera was going to be coming. I expected to see that before the end of 2021, and unfortunately, I think we have to push those plans back because of the disaster that was 2020, especially on the camera industry. And additionally, the current chip shortage is pushing back all these camera releases, so it's, it's almost like a lost year or two. But I am glad to see that Canon is following this direction. Now, if Canon launches this $799 camera in 2022, which is expected, the price will come down in the following years. So maybe it's $800 now, it's gonna be $600 in a couple of years. That is how camera pricing works. They launch it expensive, and then today's mid-level camera becomes the future entry-level camera. The Canon RP was launched at $1,300, and now you can buy it readily available for $999, or if you wait for a sale or something, you can get it for $899. Let's look at the current landscape for entry-level full-frame cameras. The Canon RP is $999, and that's what I'm filming on now. We own like six or seven of them. They are wonderful. They are a very versatile all-around camera. And when friends come to me and they're looking for their first camera, I tell them to get a Canon RP because I'm confident that it's going to continue to work for many years, that Canon's going to continue to expand the lens lineup. It's easy to use, reliable, it's, and it's just, it's fun. At that same price point, Sony offers the a7 II. I hated the a7 II when it was new, and I still hate it today. The user interface is tough, the focusing is really unreliable, the battery life is torturous, uh, the buttons and dials are just far too small. It's capable camera. It's got a lot of features in it, and you could technically produce better results than even with the Canon RP, but it's just not a great camera to experience. And in fact, I think Sony really, really needs to introduce a new under $1,000 full-frame camera. I'm waiting for that Sony A5. I am shocked that it's not already out yet, but then again, as I mentioned, the last couple of years have been crazy. Nikon's closest entry to this is the Z5, which we own and really like. For $1,300, it's hard not to recommend this camera with two card slots. Up until now, the digital camera market has used APS-C size sensors to keep the cost of cameras down. I'm going to talk about why that happened and why I don't think we need it in the future, and then I'm going to get into the specs of this upcoming Canon camera. So APS-C was introduced like in the early 2000s because before that, since like the 60s, almost all consumers had been using full frame cameras, 35 millimeter film cameras. And the first digital cameras, of course, wanted to use the same lenses. So the sensor kind of needed to be the same size. But at the time, it was really hard and really expensive to make a sensor that was as big as 35 millimeter stills film. And as a result, camera manufacturers couldn't do it inexpensively at a price that consumers could afford. So the way they found to get those costs down was to make a sensor that had a little less than half the surface size, APS-C, borrowing from a smaller film format. From that, we got the whole crop factor thing, which has confused millions of people for the last couple of decades. So to address that, camera manufacturers started making a second line of lenses just for their APS-C bodies. And so the situation we're in now is that the APS-C bodies from Sony, Canon, and Nikon are intended to be lower-end 
consumer enthusiasts, and all the lenses designed specifically for them are consumer and enthusiast lenses. And then when you get to full frame, all those lenses tend to be big and expensive and professional oriented. These cameras from Canon are marking the end of this sort of division, and I'm so happy for it. Why wouldn't Canon keep doing what they did in the DSLR era, where they have separate APS-C and full frame cameras? Well, the first is buyer confusion. I have personally helped thousands of people with their camera choices, and many, many times I've spoken with somebody who just bought a new camera, and they purchased an expensive full frame body, and then they put on it an APS-C lens. A real example I can think of is somebody who was shooting with a Sony a7R III, a 42 megapixel camera, and they put on an APS-C, I think 18 to 135 super zoom lens, because they wanted that super zoom effect, and they didn't realize that they would be using a tiny fraction of those 42 megapixels. Wait, I'm gonna do the math. 42 divided by 1.5 divided by 1.5. By putting on the APS-C lens, they were only getting 18 megapixels out of the sensor's 42 megapixels. This confusion is absolutely real, and every time I mention it, all of you people in the comments say, oh, who could be that stupid? Well, guess what? Most people don't watch YouTube videos like this. They don't take the time to understand these confusingly named lens lineups. They just go and they buy a Sony camera and they buy a Sony lens and they want to just take pictures. They don't want to be experts in it. By creating a single full frame camera and lens lineup, Canon can make this much, much simpler. Buy any RF camera, put any RF lens, and there's no crop factor, no disadvantages, everything will just work. Another challenge with this split lineup model is that consumers who start with an APS-C camera and later want to upgrade to full frame are faced with some real challenges. If they create a collection of APS-C lenses, they won't be able to use those on their full frame cameras, or if they do, they'll suffer that massive drawback in image quality, kind of making it not worth it. So if you're thinking about upgrading to a full frame camera, the best choice for you is really to sell all of your gear, your camera body, all of your APS-C lenses, and then buy all new bodies and lenses. And you know what? If you sell off all of your Canon, Nikon, or Sony gear, you might as well switch systems while you're at it. So it's kind of a big risk for the camera manufacturer because when they spend all the time building this customer's enthusiasm about photography and get them to the point where they're willing to invest more, well, they're also introducing the opportunity to jump brands and lose that brand loyalty and everything that they've invested in that customer. With a single lens lineup, you could start with the $799 Canon full frame camera, purchase any of the full frame lenses, and when you upgrade the body, you don't have to worry about any of the lenses being incompatible or hindered in any way. Now another approach is people buy an APS-C body and then they use all full frame lenses with it. But then they're not getting the best image quality out of those full frame lenses. They're paying for a lot that they're not using. They're carrying around a lot, a lot of glass that they're not taking advantage of. Again, it's a less than optimal situation. Creating a single mount with a single line of lenses, I think is really the holy grail, not just for consumer simplicity, but for retaining customers, and that's why I think it's so critical that we get down the price of full-frame mirrorless cameras. For camera manufacturers, especially in an um, industry that has a shrinking marketplace, it's vital that they don't have to split their research and development and product development across two different lens lineups. Nikon is a good example of this. They have the Nikon Z full-frame mirrorless lens lineup that they launched the same time as Canon did just two or three years ago. But Nikon went a different direction. Rather than making only full frame cameras, they introduced the Nikon Z50, an APS-C camera. And at the time they only had full frame lenses, so they had to introduce a couple of APS-C lenses to go along with that. And by putting in the research and development and product development into these two APS-C lenses, they were not creating full frame lenses that the Nikon full frame camera owners really, really wanted because their entire lens lineup is kind of sparse. And so their product development has to be split in two and nobody is really getting everything that they need because R&D and product development is continually being cut. This really hampers both sides of the lineup. We want to be able to focus all of our R&D into a single lineup so 100% of your customers 
can potentially take advantage of every single new product that you make. Companies like Nikon also end up having to make essentially duplicate lenses. Like they need a wide angle normal zoom lens for both full frame and APS-C. That means that they're managing more inventory than would other otherwise be necessary and that overall increases expense and complicates their supply chain and uh, inventory management processes. Some of you are saying, but full frame, it's too big and expensive. Not all of us want to carry around a big thing. This is totally a myth. All you have to do is look back to older full frame cameras. We're talking 60s, 70s, 80s. And you can see, even though they were DSLRs, even though they ran film, they could be very small. Full frame lenses do not have to be any bigger than APS-C or Micro Four Thirds, nor do they have to be more expensive. The reason they've been bigger and more expensive, I described earlier. Camera manufacturers had this split lineup where APS-C was for the consumers, full frame was for the professionals. Thus, camera manufacturers only made high-end gear for full frame, and that has led to the belief that only high-end gear could exist for full frame. But it's entirely possible to make inexpensive, entry-level stuff for full frame cameras, and Canon is going to do it. Here are some of their lenses. Like we already have a $200 50mm f1.8. I think the price of that should come down. I want to see it at $100, but it's a good start. They introduced the 85 f2 at $600, a great professional grade portrait lens for full frame. Still, I want to see these prices come down. The 800 f11 wildlife lens is our single favorite overall wildlife lens, and it is fantastic, small, lightweight, smaller than the micro four thirds equivalent gear, even when you include the full frame camera. And the results are absolutely spectacular. This is possible. They have a super zoom at $900, 24 to 240. That is also very small and compact. And we have it with the Canon RP. And it, as a setup, works wonderfully. It's breaking all of these myths. And Canon rumors also showed Canon's current uh, product roadmap internal and secret, but on it we saw a 100 to 400 millimeter f5.6 to 7.1. I think that's going to be the equivalent of the current 75 to 300 lenses that we all kind of start shooting sports and wildlife on. And thus, because of the high f-stop f7.1, I think they can bring that price down. I think it'll be around $600. There was also an 18 to 45 wide angle lens with an f5.6 f-stop. So again, these don't have to be fast lenses, even though they're full frame. We can get those smaller sensor equivalents by just raising that f-stop number, letting in a little less light. It means you have to design less glass. It makes everything lighter. And I think you could do a super wide like that for under $500. We're talking like uh, micro four thirds price points here, right? And we saw a 24 millimeter f1.8 wide angle prime that I think will be priced inexpensively at around $300. Here's what I think the specs are going to be. I'm taking a wild guess at the name. I know it's going to be a Canon R something, and I'm guessing the Canon RC. And I made the C for like consumer or cheap. It's going to be full frame. I'm going to guess it's going to be a low megapixel, lower quality sensor, like a 20 megapixel sensor, but maybe not a backside illuminated design. So you won't get like the same dynamic range. You know what? The Canon RP we're filming this on has a lower grade sensor. That's why it's so expensive. But nobody complains about the image quality from it because nowadays image quality is actually less important since the primary outlet for sharing from these types of cameras is social media, small images anyway. I think it has to have the flip forward screen from the Canon RP. It has to have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. They're going to cut out as much as they can, but those things can't be compromised. Something that can be compromised is sensor stabilization. It, I just don't think it's going to have it, and I don't think it's going to have an electronic viewfinder. It doesn't have to be expensive to stick an electronic viewfinder on there, but have you ever seen anyone like under 20 pick up and use a camera for the first time? They hold it out like this, like a smartphone. They don't hold it up to their eye like us old folks do. Thus, I think they can save a little bit of money a little bit of cost and a little bit of weight by taking off that viewfinder completely and using Canon's excellent rear screen. I know I like a viewfinder too, but we're looking at ways to differentiate this from the more expensive competitors and also uh, reduce the cost and simplicity of manufacturing. It should have internal memory 
like our smartphones do, but I think they're still going to stick to a single SD card in there. I think it'll have human and animal IAF. I think they want to put 4K on the box, but I don't think they actually want to give us full width 4K video because that might cannibalize their other offerings. So I think it's going to be severely cropped 4K 30, not unlike what the Canon EOS R offers. And I think it's going to come with a free trial to the image.canon online imaging service. Now, you might have used image.canon and it's currently just completely free. So why am I saying it's going to be a free trial? What image.canon does is it allows your camera to transmit pictures as you take them over a Wi-Fi network where they're stored in the cloud. From there, they can be transmitted to your computer to Google Drive or to the Adobe Creative Cloud, among other things. Thus, it can, you can take a picture and within a few seconds, it can automatically appear in your Lightroom. And it's not perfect now, but when it works, it's pretty amazing and it's definitely the future. Now, the way Image.Canon currently works is you can leave your pictures on there for 30 days. They don't want to be storing your pictures for long term. That seems real dumb to me, like they're leaving money on the table. Just about everybody from Adobe to Apple to Google offers storage as a service. So why not offer to host people's pictures for them indefinitely where they get a real-time instant backup and they can easily share pictures to their phone or to social media and just charge people the typical $10 per month per terabyte fee that other people do by being able to make some money off of some portion of this audience who wants things to be simple and doesn't want to have to be pulling out the SD card and putting it into SD card reader in an absolutely antiquated process, Canon can make some extra money and that will allow them to reduce the price of this camera, keeping their costs down by basically making it a loss leader because they're going to be making money off of monthly fees. Think about it, Canon. I'm kind of planting these ideas here. Maybe this is going to end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. In the comments down below, I'd like to hear what you'd want from an entry-level full-frame camera and what is your price point. Keep in mind, these prices are for the body only, so you'd have to pay a little bit more for a lens, but I would expect the kit lens to only add about $100 to the price. When I talk to people, almost everybody, whether they're a waiter, living with their parents or they're a multi-millionaire, they say they want to spend $500 on a camera. So I always think that $500 is the sweet spot. And so I want to see this price driven down even further, but I think it might take longer than I initially thought. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe. And when you do go and set up a real website, which you really <laughs> need to do, I'm so sick of having to figure out if I should look up somebody on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. Set up your own website, get your own domain. So you're not gmail.com, go to squarespace.com slash Tony. It is super easy and completely free. Just try it out. You'll be glad you did. If you want to keep it, use the coupon code Tony and you can save yourself 10%. Bye.